Millions of pounds have been spent on the fight against football hooliganism. But whether it's at home or abroad, London's hooligan fans fight on. Can football's hooligans be defeated? The rioting that took place at last week's Spurs game against the Dutch team Feyenoord brought renewed calls for something more to be done to tackle football hooliganism. Forty fans went to hospital in Rotterdam, many with serious stab wounds. Before the match, Spurs fans had smashed up two cross-channel ferries and rampaged through the town. But this was only the latest in a series of incidents this season involving London fans. They've shown that despite all efforts to stamp it out, football hooliganism is still alive and kicking. In September at Brighton, hundreds of Chelsea fans invade the pitch. The fighting that follows leaves four policemen in hospital, 14 fans arrested, and this Chelsea fan in prison for six months. And in October, football hooliganism claims its sixth fatality in ten years, when a 20-year-old Chelsea fan dies in hospital after being beaten up by rival fans following his team's game at Huddersfield. Coming to terms with football hooliganism has been a problem that's been exercising the minds of the public at large, the football authorities and successive governments for the past 20 years. But they still haven't managed to solve the problem. Despite all the attempts to stop him, the football hooligan just refuses to give up causing trouble at matches. To most people, the behaviour of football hooligans seems repugnant and mindless, but nevertheless, it makes sense to them. And understanding why this is provides the best chance of assessing what steps might be taken to solve the problem. Paul is a loyal Chelsea supporter who's often been involved in fighting at matches. Every Saturday for the last 13 years, he's travelled from his home on a council estate near Weybridge to watch Chelsea play football. When they're at home, like hundreds of other Chelsea fans, he meets his mates before the game for a drink in one of the several pubs around the ground. In the years he's been coming to Chelsea, he's seen them win the FA Cup and then be relegated twice to the second division. Yet his support for the club has never faltered. This is what it's all about. You're making phone calls all the way. Where are you going Saturday? How are you getting there? To me, it's what all I've got in life. I mean, I've got a nice girlfriend, I've had nice girlfriends and I've lost them through football. Through going to watch football. But really, that's all I've got. I've got a nice home and everything, and parents and everything. But that's all I want, is football. Paul's devotion to Chelsea is so great that the fights he's been involved in with rival fans has meant him being fined many hundreds of pounds. He doesn't go looking for fights, but like many Chelsea fans, he won't run away from one either. If Chelsea was to run from a certain game, before you know it, it's all around London. Oh, you run from so and so. Well, it's, it's not hard, is it? Then we go to a game, then we get slagged down for running at, say, somewhere like Cambridge or something which to other teams is, is ridiculous. But Chelsea, as other fans who, unlike Paul, don't need to be provoked before they'll fight. After a few drinks, Ralph is one of them. I mean, we have, we have got him nuts at Chelsea, haven't we, you know? I mean, I suppose I could say on one when, once I've had a, a lot to drink and everything, right, you know? And I'll go there and I'll get involved. And I, you know, I do go a bit nutty, like, you know. I go a bit over the top than what I normally would do. And, you know, we've got, we've got a few people like that at Chelsea that are just crazy, you know. They just sort of go in. To them, it, it's nothing, really. They ain't bothered. And, uh, you know, they just run in, fist and feet flying everywhere. And that's it, you know. Whatever their differences in approach, a minority of Chelsea fans like Ralph and Paul fight for one reason, to defend their team's reputation against any team that threatens it. But Chelsea isn't the only London team with fans who've got a reputation for fighting. In the first division there's Arsenal, Tottenham Hotspur and West Ham, and in the third division Millwall. 
These reputations have been built up over a number of years and have hardened into bitter rivalries, not only between London clubs, but between clubs from outside London too. Their teams like Portsmouth, Sheffield Wednesday, Leeds United, Manchester United and Newcastle United. Learning why the fans feel they need to fight for their club's reputation is a key to understanding their behaviour. This is the belief of sociologist John Williams. He's made a special study of football hooligans and has travelled all over Britain and Europe with them. The work, kinds of working class community that we've been looking at is, is uh, what one might describe as a lower working class council estate. Um, these seem to be communities characterised by a territoriality, defence of the home turf, uh, a stress on masculinity, being able to look after oneself, being able to fight. It's also the case that a lot of the authorities and people who comment on hooliganism seem to think that it's meaningless. They don't see that uh, a lot of the lads who get involved in fighting in football matches actually view the actions of opposing supporters as in some sense a violation of their territory. And of course on Saturdays the home territory is not simply uh, the local street or the local estate, the local neighbourhood. It can be the entire city, the bus stations, the railway stations, the football terraces, especially the home end. Many football fans then see the home end as the supreme symbol of their territory, which for the hooligan element amongst them has to be defended against rival fans at all costs. And how these fans defend that territory is crucial to how they get their reputation. Well, the point is you've got to go in there because they're going to try and take your reputation away from you, aren't they? I mean, they're, not, they're there to have a go at you, you know? They think, right, they're Chelsea, they've got your reputation, let's have a pop at them, see what we can do. But at Chelsea's ground, fans like Ralph very rarely get the opportunity to defend Chelsea's reputation. The police are well organised and keep both sets of fans away from each other. So at home games like today's against Cardiff, all the police have to worry about is the odd fan who decides to have a go. And they soon move in to stop incidents like this developing into something worse. Hooligan fans know they just won't get a fight at a home game, whether it's against Cardiff or any other team. Increasingly, it's something that people like Ralph have come to realise. You, you can't get no violence at Chelsea now, because the police are so organised really well that they just blank it straight out, like, you know. Chelsea Football Club, in fact, have developed very sophisticated methods for controlling the fans here at Stamford Bridge. They've installed video cameras to watch the crowd and pick out ringleaders. They've got procedures which keep the rival groups of fans well apart. In fact, the club has been so successful in containing hooliganism at home that when there is trouble at Stamford Bridge, it's now mainly restricted to obscene or racist chants. Unfortunately, Chelsea would not let the London programme film inside the ground to show how their control methods work. However, Tottenham Hotspur did allow our cameras in. They allowed us to film at their recent game against Notts County to show how they've coped with the problem. In common with many London clubs, at White Hart Lane, Tottenham try to make sure that the visiting Notts County fans are separated from their home supporters by making them use one special entrance. Once in the ground, they're segregated from their home fans by a series of steel pens. Steel pens like these have been developed mainly in response to a rash of bad football riots in the mid-70s, which brought in new legislation to make crowd control much easier. Throughout the match, the police keep an eye out for troublemakers, quickly ejecting those that come to their notice. And just to make sure there's no trouble when fans leave the ground after the game, police throw a cordon around the Notts County fans to keep them apart from the Spurs supporters. Only when the streets are clear will the visitors be allowed to set off home. On most Saturdays, the police are active at the London railway stations as well as at the football grounds. On busy days, up to 50,000 fans use London's mainline stations and underground system on their way to or from matches. But again, a watchful and discreet police presence is on hand to head off any trouble. Segregating football fans before, during and after matches is the keystone of the strategy that's been developed for dealing with football hooliganism in London. 
It's a strategy that's aimed at preventing trouble before it starts, and the police feel they've got it just about right. It's, it's been very successful in London. Um, look, particularly um, over the past few years, we've recognised the fact that um, problems not only exist at the grounds in the immediate locality of the grounds. Um, we now um, work out how supporters are getting to London in the first place. What times they're likely to arrive? Are they likely to spend any time in the West End of London before or after the match? And we coordinate our policing, particularly on Saturdays, to take all of this into account. In fact, the police and the London clubs have become so experienced that they've got hooliganism in the capital in a stranglehold. But fans from London clubs are still heavily involved in hooliganism. Their problem is that they can no longer defend their club's reputation and territory at home. And so the problem has moved on, literally, to the London club's away matches. At away games, fans like Ralph can once again take the field and show that the Chelsea supporters haven't gone soft. You know who's going to go in the away supporters end? And that's it, you go in there, you keep your mouth shut until they start singing and giving it the verbal and all that. And then you just go into them, just let them have the lot, like, you know. Just run in, shout out Chelsea, let them know who you are, give them an hiding or a battering or whatever. The police come in, throw you out, and that's it, it's all over. In other words, we've done them, we've took their end, like, you know. That's it, we've achieved the main thing, haven't we? We've took their end. Why they they haven't took us, have they? Why is that the main thing? Well, it is, and it? it's got to be, because otherwise they're going to take you. I mean, you're going to lose all your respect. If you don't, with the reputation, see, if you don't go to the ground and take their end, people are going to think, well, what's going on with Chelsea these days, you know? What have they done so far? Nothing, really. And uh, you're going to lose all your respect. And then people are going to start dropping out then, and you don't want that, because you're going to get clubs come down and think, right, we can do this, we can do that, we can have a go at Chelsea now. But football hooligans aren't able to cause trouble at every away game. When Spurs fans infiltrated the Birmingham end last month, the police soon threw them out. Clubs in cities like Birmingham are just as well policed and organised as they are in London. But not all clubs are in the big cities or in the first division. For this reason, some club managers like Malcolm MacDonald of Fulham believe that it's the smaller provincial clubs in the second division that are now the most vulnerable to travelling hooligans. It's basically that the police, um, because they are not au fait with um, hordes of, of football supporters, that they can cause as, as much problems, as much of a problem as can the supporters themselves. Because I think that supporters might, if they sense a bit of an inexperience, because remember, these football supporters are as experienced in going to football matches as the London and Birmingham police are. And they smell when, say, the Shrewsbury police are inexperienced. And so they take liberties. It's not only the policing at these provincial grounds that's at fault. Many of the smaller second division clubs are simply not prepared for teams with a large following away from home. At Chelsea, for example, have the third largest away support in the country after Manchester United and Liverpool. And it is a fact that they, they are apt to ring up a club secretary three weeks in advance and say, look, we've got 5,000 supporters coming to your club on such and such a date, what are you going to do about it? And their opponents simply refuse to believe it. They make polite noises, put the phone down, uh, so that suddenly that town on that particular day has 5,000 Chelsea supporters descending, on it, descending upon it. And there is immediate uh, threatening situation because not enough provision has been made for them. I mean, look, look what happened at Brighton. The police was well unorganised at Brighton. That's why it all happened, like, all the, all the trouble that I mean, went on, right? But, I mean, we had about, must admit, we had about 15,000 fans there at Brighton. And uh, most, of them were there, most of them were there Friday afternoon or Friday evening. And the police was so unorganised, it was unreal. There just wasn't, just wasn't enough police officers to cope with the trouble. If the away games are the best hunting grounds in Britain for London's hooligans, there are even better opportunities for disorder in Europe. Indeed, for the violent supporters, Europe is ideal. It offers big grounds, few restrictions and innocent police forces. The European matches are the hooligans' super away games. For them, last week's Spurs match against Feyenoord in Rotterdam was paradise. It was a match where reputations were at stake. Nine long years ago, Spurs were beaten in a crucial European game by Feyenoord, a match disfigured by vicious fighting on the terraces. Knowing what happened then, Tottenham Football Club had warned the Dutch of trouble to come and pleaded for no tickets to be sold on the day of the game. 
While Tottenham Football Club itself cannot be blamed for what happened last week, its London fans took every advantage of slack Dutch policing. According to West Ham supporter Kaz Pennant, this is a pattern in Europe that looks likely to continue. Pennant has just spent a year in prison for stabbing a Sheffield fan, although he's always maintained his innocence. In the late 70s, he was a member of the Intercity firm, a feared and notorious gang of West Ham hooligans. He and the local journalist have just finished a book about the Intercity firm. So what's all happening there is they know like they're losing the battle at home in England, right? But abroad, right, that's where the party is, party is now, right? Abroad they ain't got together, still can't, not used to any mobs, just the English, right? And they go out there, they ain't got the English old bill, right? And they're in the field day because they're not used to like yeah, the English, English supporters' tactics, their ways, and they're just not ready for them. International matches abroad are just another example of this away game syndrome. When England played Switzerland in 1981 in a World Cup qualifier, hundreds of English supporters ran riot through the stadium, while the Swiss police looked on helplessly. And in Copenhagen last year, a smoke bomb was the prelude to an afternoon of violence when England played Denmark. The police had no effective control procedures against mobs of English fans who fought with the Dutch fans on the terraces. Even plain clothes policemen like this one in the grey sweater were reduced to lashing out in desperation. The whole pattern of violence at away games has been brought about in part by the way the problem has been traditionally dealt with. John Williams believes it's simply been displaced from one place to another. As the football authorities began to try and control the phenomenon inside football grounds, all they really succeeded in doing was displacing it. So as more pens, more fences were erected in grounds, then the trouble moved outside. As more police moved outside, then the trouble moved to service stations, to railway stations, to the streets, to the city centre. As more police got on the streets earlier, then football fans started to arrive earlier. And it's been consistently displaced in that form. And you might argue that uh, as controls have been increasingly um, applied in the domestic context, then to an extent the problem has been displaced abroad. So we have in the mid-1970s, early 1980s, incidents of English fans being involved in various kinds of hooliganism and vandalism at matches abroad, both with their club sides and with the England national side. Hooliganism was displaced out of the grounds and onto the football specials in the mid-70s. But when troublesome fans were banned from the specials, they simply travelled on ordinary trains, helped by one or two windfalls. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, cut hundred, like, West Ham's top boys were using it in the city, and, like, and that was the cream, and I was getting all the rares and everything. But when it went nationwide out of West Ham was when the personal come out, they started introducing free tickets or cheap tickets for the intercity trains while collecting personal tickets and things like that. Well now, like, yeah, I mean, everyone could afford to use the intercity. Then the student railway card, Jimmy Savile's student railway card, that is a godsend, you know what I mean? Sent down, like, half price in the city travel all, all year round, and it covered the football season. For a tiny minority of hooligans, more sophisticated methods of control will only result in more elaborate methods to avoid detection, displacing the problem once more. Well, like, it's got to be organised, like, it could continue, like, how do, you, how do you think it survived, you know what I mean? Like, every season they say they're going to stop football hooligans and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And every season the same thing happens. Like, they just use different tactics to get them out of things. But the football authorities have no answer to the problem of hooliganism simply being displaced from one area to another. Their methods are still only to clamp down further. To combat the hooligans, there are two main lines of attack. The first is to get crowd control at more small clubs, tightened up to London standards. Richard Faulkner is secretary of the Football Trust, which finances new schemes to combat hooliganism. He knows what can be done. Stoke City have got a system of television operating outside the ground so they can control the movement of fans from railway stations and coach parks to the turnstiles. This is operated by the local police force. Um, other clubs are looking at identity card systems like Derby County. Uh, in the case of Watford, they've had a particularly imaginative scheme which we as a trust were, were able to assist with and they have built a new railway station on a line which isn't normally used on a Saturday which has the effect of taking the visiting supporters away from the town centre on match days. 
But despite schemes like Watford's, many small clubs still have a long way to go. In some of the rural areas where you've got smaller clubs which have come up from the third or the fourth division and are finding themselves playing against opposition which have large away followings and sometimes large tr largely troublesome away followings, the, the task of, the, uh, of safety inside the grounds is much more difficult. But if the authorities tighten up on the smaller clubs, the hooligans will be denied their outlet at away games in Britain. Then the pressure on European games will get even stronger. So the authorities' second line of attack to combat the hooligans is to get the European clubs to tighten up. Sports Minister Neil McFarlane is already very worried about next Wednesday's England v Luxembourg match. He has urged the Luxembourg authorities not to sell tickets on the day. Others want to go further. Chris Navrat is a football writer working for the Sunday Times. There's a, <coughs> the European authorities have spent a year looking at the problem of hooliganism because it's not confined just to Britain. And the European sports ministers have come up with a plan which may or may not be accepted, which is that people who go abroad and commit offences will, instead of being immediately deported back to their own country, tried in that country, even if convicted, jailed or whatever in that country. And the belief is that that would deter hooligans. People would be so worried about spending a year or six months in jail in a foreign country that that would, in their mind, prevent them from running riot. If the European Sports Minister's plan is accepted, it could well be that football hooliganism in Europe will then be reduced as well as in this country. But the question then is where will the hooligans go? Some observers and fans believe the process of moving the problem on might even result in moving it right out of the football grounds, but it still won't get rid of the hardcore hooligans. It would be very difficult to conceive of a way that one could get rid of hooliganism uh, using the kinds of means the authorities have been using. Uh, in recent years. I don't think one, one is ever going to completely eradicate hooliganism via uh, penning, segregation, policing and so on. You can reduce the problem to manageable proportions in that way. You might even succeed in displacing the problem away from the football ground. So as far as the football authority is concerned they might be satisfied with a situation in which uh, at least hooliganism wasn't occurring within the ground, spilling onto the field and stopping matches. But of course, you won't change the values and attitudes of lads who are involved in hooliganism by doing these kinds of things. You know, they say they're going to close grounds down, like, you know, say we will play the match without any supports, any supporters, like, you know. But what is that? It, that's nothing, is it? I mean, doesn't make the slightest bit of difference. You're still going to get fighting out in the streets and things like that, you know. Even if it's not at the football, you're still going to get with rival supporters clashing in pubbies, uh, pubs, I mean, and uh, like discos and things like that. I mean, like you go to a disco, you get a group of Tottenham, you get a group of Chelsea. You're not just going to stand there and talk to each other, are you? I mean, halfway through the night when you've all had a good drink, up, it's obviously there's going to be a big row. So it'll never stop, no matter what they try to do. You won't stop it. It's quite possible then that a really effective clampdown by the football authorities of Britain and Europe could lead to hooliganism breaking out somewhere else. As we've seen, the problem has only been moved on and the hooligans are driven by some very basic motives. So where could the hooliganism burst out next if it's denied an outlet at football? Could it be in the high street or the local disco? Some people are convinced that for all its horrors, hooliganism is best left where it is now. Uh, the question I always ask people when they talk about football hooliganism and football violence is well if we were to ban professional football as of now from this country would that eradicate football violence and football hooliganism and I'm sure it wouldn't and I think that the view that must be taken is that football in, an, in, a, in a peculiar way is doing society a favor by at least magnetizing that hooligan element into the football grounds, which are well policed, have had vast fortunes which are spent on uh, for safety reasons, and at least it's controllable to the people that are within the stadiums. Now imagine if there were no football and that these, that this hooligan element, this violent element in our society, uh, weren't just a group for a Saturday afternoon at a football stadium.